Also, sehr geehrter Herr Bundeskanzler, sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin Hamke, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, es ist mir eine Ehre, heute hier bei Ihnen zu sein und 60 Jahre Wirtschaftsrat zu feiern. Seit 60 Jahren sind Sie im Mittelpunkt der deutschen Industrie und das bedeutet natürlich im Mittelpunkt der europäischen Industrie. Es ist immerhin Ihr Geburtstag, also legen wir keine falsche Bescheidenheit an den Tag. Am Vorabend der zweiten industriellen Revolution übernahm Deutschland die Führung. Deutschland war nur das erste Industrieland der Welt. Es bot auch die besten Arbeitsbedingungen, die höchsten Löhne, die kürzesten Arbeitszeiten und eine bessere medizinische Versorgung als an der Nord. Nach den Worten Werte von Werner von Siemens hatte die Industrie die Aufgabe, die gesamte Menschheit voranzubringen. Today, ladies and gentlemen, our European industry has the same opportunity. Our European industry has the same capacity to lift up all of humanity again. And this time, this opportunity is to overcome the biggest challenge of our lifetime, climate change. Climate change is by far the biggest reason to keep our industry here in Europe. Yes, of course, we need European industry to bring prosperity. We need European industry to drive investment. We need European industry to create jobs. But we also need industry in Europe because we need climate solutions. Solutions that citizens and governments can use, but solutions that can only be invented, implemented with speed and scale by the industry. And let me even tell you more. Very often the political horizon is 2050. But in reality, we see that a lot of our industrial players are moving much faster than that horizon of 2050. Some of you are going to net zero by 2040. Some of you are going to net zero by 2035. And I have to say, over the past years, I have been visiting so many of your colleagues when they were opening new offices, when they were opening new storage place, sometimes when they were planning new blast furnaces for steel. All of the company visits that I have done were always centered around driving down greenhouse gas emissions much faster than what governments are actually asking them. And I think that our industry, our companies, are not getting enough credit for all the efforts that they are doing in driving this faster than what is expected. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we sometimes hear people saying that the solution would be degrowth, that a myth that we could combat climate change with a strategy of less. Less growth, less investment, less consumption, probably also less job creation. This will never work. And it will never work for a couple of reasons, but the number one reason is that a strategy of less is completely contrary to our human nature. People in life want to go forward, not backward. It's very hard to convince people that going backward would actually be the solution for a better life. And in our history, it has been like that for humanity as a whole. Humanity has never solved their biggest endeavors by putting progress in reverse. The contrary is actually true. And the contrary is a strategy of more. A strategy of more, but better. A strategy of more, but different. Different in the sense that it needs to disconnect economic growth by the growth of CO2 emissions. Now, 
This is not new. If we look in Europe, since the 1990s already, we have been doing that. We have been able to organize a structural disconnect between economic growth and the increase of emissions. And that structural disconnect has been widening over the last year. And if you look at the numbers of last year, the economic growth in Europe was a modest 1.5%. But the greenhouse gas emissions went down by 4%. How did we achieve this? Not by degrowth. We achieved it by technological innovation, by inventions, and by an industry that is implementing that innovation and those technical solutions. So it would be a drama for the world. And it would be a real drama for everyone who cares about the, fact, the fight against climate change. It would be a drama if industrial production would shift away from Europe, if it would shift away to other places in the world, that would today be the real risk in our fight against climate change. So the question in front of us, so the question in front of us is how do we organize this? How do we organize our society so that we can continue to grow industry in Europe? Because it's good for us, but also because it is good for the rest of the world, because it's the best way to reduce the growth in climate and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, to me, the answer is with a European industrial deal, which is at the same level as the European Green Deal. Both would not be in a position one to another. Both actually need to reinforce each other. Now, how do we do this? Well, three things are important. Number one, we have to make clear policy choices. More focus. Let's not try to do everything at the same time. Let us focus on what is the most important. Number two, Europe needs to make a shift. Today, in Europe, we are a continent of sticks. We also need to be a continent of carrots. And when I talk about carrots, I would mean European carrots and not 27 different national carrots. Now, I will explain more in detail what I mean by that. And number three, number three, we need more energy. More energy produced here in Europe. Cheap, green, and a lot of it. Now, let me start with the first point, and the first point was about focus. The problem today with European governments and with governments in Europe is that too often we slice our legislation instead of planning a clear way ahead. And let me give you an example. For cars, we are currently discussing the Euro Norm 7 for combustion engines in 2025. At the same time, all of our production platforms are speeding up for the production of electric cars. We could question if this is actually the most efficient way forward. At the same time, we are revising REACH, or we have a new nature restoration law. Is it actually the right time today to put all these legislations together knowing that the crucial element is the energy transition? If we are overburdening people with rules and regulation, we risk losing the public support for the green agenda. And I have to say, we have done quite a good job in the last years in convincing people that climate change is real and that climate change is because of human activity. We've been able to quite successfully to convince people of that. People understand that it will be hard to tackle. People understand that it will demand an effort. People understand that it will demand financing. But what we have to be careful now is to not lose that momentum that we have built. And we could lose that momentum that we have built if we overburden ourselves with challenges that are not as life-threatening as climate change is. We need to keep our eye on the ball. 
and that means driving down greenhouse gases. And otherwise, there is a risk that we tackle ourselves and that we would actually lose the momentum that we have built on fighting climate neutrality. Let me be clear. This does not mean that lower ranked priorities, such as nature restoration, pesticide control, soil quality, this does not mean that they are not important. But it means that we as governments need to be much more coherent, much more straightforward in our job. And our job is providing our industry a stable and a productive framework around the elements that are most important. And today, fighting climate change should be our number one priority and it should be reflected in that way in the framework that we are organizing for you. This brings me to our second point, and that's the shift we need to make from sticks to carrot, and I told you I was going to explain it more in detail. The EU has always taken the lead in greening our economy, but up to now we've always done it through regulation. Regulation is what would call someone, someone would call the stick. But with the Inflation Reduction Act, America is actually holding a mirror to us Europeans. And it is clear that the United States is not so much a country of sticks, it is more a country of carrots. Today, America has lower energy prices than us in Europe, lower industrial wages, and they are adding subsidies to that equation. And I think it's clear that we in Europe need to shift gears. It is time for us to also become a continent of carrots. It is clear that we also need to be a continent where public support is available for clean tech investments. But we have to be very clear under which conditions we want that to happen. First of all, this support cannot only be given on the national level in a national logic. But first and foremost, it should be done in a European logic. Now, why is it so important? Well, that is because it needs to match your business logic. Your business logic, and I could take the example of Belgium and Germany, our industries are integrated. Many of you are active in Belgium, are active in Germany, are active in so many countries. Do the national borders actually have any industrial logic, not at all. I mean, we're in integrated in, uh, and we're integrated in a good way. So our schemes also need to reflect that. They also need to reflect that because that's the best way to protect the integrity of our single market and we absolutely need to avoid that we would get into a subsidy race that would distort our greatest asset and our greatest asset is the single market. Second element is that we have to be clear on the fact that it cannot be helicopter money. Public support should go strictly to investments and technologies that aggressively drive down greenhouse gas emissions, regardless of which sector we are talking about. It is not up to us politicians to make the choices between the sectors, but we have to be very clear on the objective and the objective should be to drive down the emissions as fast as we can. That means... That means, dear friends, that means that we need to aim high to develop the technologies of the future and those technologies will also be used worldwide and that's technological leadership and technological leadership is what in Europe we need. Clean tech invested and produced in Europe, it is the future of our internal market. If we want to remain upright in this, and in this more hostile geopolitical environment, Europe has to become leading in clean tech and has to become leading in digital. And really, that will be the difference between losing the future or winning the future. The difference between having European industrial standards that are a weakness or making the choice to have it as a strength, to have it as a way to dominate the world in an offensive way 
and not use regulation in a defensive one. For Europe to be a leader in that economy of tomorrow, we need that. We need to make that shift from sticks to carrots, but you also need something else, and that is abundance of energy. And to make the point about abundance of energy, I would like to use a, a, a challenge. And the challenge, maybe some of you might have heard of that. The challenge is, where are my flying cars? Now, some of you German cars are flying, but not in a literal way. You have to know, I was, uh, I was born in the 70s. And as a kid in the 70s and in the 80s, flying cars, they were always part of the vision of the future. And now, today, people of my age, we are asking the question, where are those flying cars that we have dreamed about when we were kids? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. Flying cars are technologically not that hard. But flying cars need abundance of cheap en energy. An abundance of cheap energy is not what we have today. And you know that abundance of energy has always been a taboo in Europe. And for a good reason, because European energy was mostly imported fossil fuel. It was bad for our wallets and it was bad for our environment. So today, we have an amazing opportunity in front of us. We have the opportunity to break this taboo, to make the shift away from imported fossil fuels to homegrown net zero energy production. And if we want this, there as well, we will have to shift drastically and we will have to accelerate the energy transition in Europe. A few things are, are important for that. First of all, that means investing in renewable energy production by investing in battery technology, investing in hydrogen infrastructure. It's beefing up the existing capacities like Chancellor Scholz is doing here in Germany. It means also that we have to continue in linking up our different countries. For example, around the North Sea. This is what we decided a month ago in Ostend. This was an integrated approach for our industry. Not just grids, but also hydrogen, also CO2 infrastructure. One integrated approach across the continent that speeds up the implementation, that standardizes things, that also helps our industry. Third element, it also means that we need to recognize that nuclear power is part of the energy strategy in Europe. And especially... <laughs> this means especially if we can make it safer and less wasteful, nuclear should make its comeback as a reliable and a carbon-free base load for our grids. <laughs> Additional element, and this is last but not least, we need to upgrade our trade relationships and we have to remove some of the strategic dependencies that we have. Reshoring industries should be an option. It should not be an option because politicians say so. It will be an option because it makes economic sense. And Europe needs to build itself in a position of strength. A position of strength which we then use to negotiate with the other trading blocks. One element to me is crucial there. It's reciprocity. Reciprocity should be the guiding principle in our trade relationships especially with China. It is those things which are not possible for European companies in China, well, then it should be clear that those things which are not possible for European companies, they should not be possible for Chinese companies here in Europe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the European Industrial Deal 
should be part and parcel of the renewal of our internal market. And you know that internal market was designed by Jacques Delors and it's one of the greatest things we have done in Europe in the previous decades. But now it is 30 years old. 30 years ago it was a visionary project. The internet was not invented by them. Since then so many things have changed. So many new technologies, so many new sectors have sprung to life. Next to our manufacturing industry, next to chemistry, next to steel, we now have nanotech, we have biotech, we have artificial intelligence, we'll have 6G, so many things that you know more about than I do. And so what we need is also a big step in the deepening of our internal market. A deepening that safeguards our legacy industries while embracing the new ones. And that's because policymakers in general like to think in categories, in categories and like to think in sectors. But the reality on the ground is another one. Your reality is a different one. You work in an integrated way. You are linked across so many different sectors. So it means that this is it's probably not the most sexy part of the things we talk about, the deepening of the internal market. It is very technical, it is often very hard, but that needs to happen. The single market is the greatest asset that we have. We've done a great job 30 years ago, but it is time now to deepen that internal market, an internal market that should be less naive and that should make ourselves stronger in the existing industries, but also is ready for the industries of tomorrow. <laughs> Dear friends, let me finish by saying that I am optimistic about the future of European industry. Because every day, I see the incredible talents that we have across the European continent that we see in our European companies. From the smallest company in my hometown to the biggest trade missions, we have such an incredible amount of talent that we have. Also, I bin für die Zukunft optimistisch. Gemeinsam mit unseren europäischen Kollegen und allen voran dem Bundeskanzler ist uns bewusst, dass wir unbedingt Maßnahmen für die Industrie ergreifen müssen. Und zwar jetzt. Meine Damen und Herren, im Jahr 2024 übernimmt Belgien der Vorsitz des Rates der Europäischen Union. Dabei werden wir die Bemühungen vorantreiben, die legislative Arbeit zu unterstützen und unsere Prioritäten für die nächsten fünf Jahre festzulegen. Unsere industrielle Zukunft wird im Mittelpunkt dieser Überlegungen stehen. Ich danke Ihnen. Well, you can hear it. <laughs> We say thank you. Thank you. Meine Damen, meine Herren, ich mache weiter. Wir haben nämlich ein straffes Zeitmanagement hier und müssen natürlich pünktlich um 17 Uhr fertig werden. Deswegen nur eine Frage an Herrn De Gros. I will switch again to English because I think it's easier. So you talked about that we need lots of clean energy that will be crucial and you talked about the North Sea Summit which took place in Belgium just one month ago. Um, nine countries met there to talk about wind, about offshore wind power which should be demand expanded and you demanded more speed, you demanded easier approval procedures for wind wheels and that those procedures need to be the same in every country and you also demanded cross-border power lines. So you demanded a lot and you said regarding the last years, the last years were rather disappointing, your words. So what makes you think that next year will be better? that we will have really cross-border cooperation regarding such huge energy projects? Okay, long question, I will try to do a yeah. short answer. Um, no, what we, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the participants and, uh, and definitely um, Chancellor Schultz for being, uh, for being present there. 
What we see in, in renewables is that the industry needs to shift a bit from innovation driven to industrialization driven. And what we see in the offshore wind industry is that yes, there is innovation. And that innovation takes place and that's good. But the marginal gains that we have in innovation, they actually could be off weighted if we can implement faster. And that means that as countries, if we standardize, for example, if we standardize our bidding procedures for the new parks, if we standardize the safety regulations, if we standardize the way the parks are being connected one with another, Sam. if we also make some technological choices to standardize, we will be able to build much faster. And what we will gain by building faster will actually offset what we have on the innovation part. And I'm not saying that we should stop with innovating. Mm. But today, any year we build a park faster is a year that is one oh, yeah. in a year that we're not polluting using fossil fuels. And so that's how we as Europeans can make a difference. If we start setting the standards, mm. if we start setting the industrialization standards, that's what I said in my speech. If we want to make progress, it needs to be progress at scale. If you want progress to happen, border. industry needs to be part of it because you have the power to industrialize at scale and that's why we need to come to a partnership that is good for you, that is profitable for you, nothing will happen if it is not profitable, but is also to the benefit of us Europeans and that helps us in creating technological leadership, technological leadership that will force the rest of the world to follow us. And we are still talking about a lot of ifs. Would you say that there's really the political will to do it? Yes, that, that's what I felt in, uh, in, in Ostende. Okay. It was so you're politicians, optimistic. but it was more than, more than 200 different companies that were there. And I think more than ever, we understand that uh, if we work together and if we understand our interests, and for us to understand your interests is a crucial one, we will make the fight against climate change happen with European technology and a technology that will give us leadership in the world and that will drive growth, investment and jobs. And that's the deal we need to make between us. Okay, you're still optimistic. I am. Though we have a lot of challenges here. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much.